Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I'm very happy to have this opportunity today to introduce the hard work of an IML team to everyone here. I have to admit that I'm not a leader of the team. Probably, probably it's because I contribute too few. I didn't contribute too much, so they told me, John, you have to do something. That's why I'm here. We live with all sorts of standards every day. Some of the standards help us to communicate, to share, and to exchange information. For example, imagine you are designing a website. You don't have to worry about how the website looks or the website looks differently in different browsers as long as you follow this W3C standard. And this is how uh, the conference website looks in Firefox in Linux. And this is, it looks exactly the same as how it looks in uh, Internet Explorer in Windows. You can think of that in computational neural science, when you design a neural network model, it's sort of like you are designing a website. And a neural network simulator is like a browser that show up the results of your work. However, in this field, we do need to worry about that your network model, different simulators shows different results for the same model. And this causes a tremendous problem in model sharing and reproducibility. So why we have this issue? This is mainly due to two layers of problem. The first, we lack of a standard way to describe the, uh, a neural network model. The second layer is different simulators implement simulation strategy differently. So to address this problem, we propose a descriptive language to describe, it, to describe and define a neural network models. It's called NIML, stands for Network Interchange for Neuroscience Modeling Language. NIML is independent of any simulator, and it is interface between model concepts and the simulators. Ideally, you can use an IML to describe, to fully describe your network model, and then use any simulators that support IML to simulate it and to and obtain the same results. IML has several unique features. The first is a layer. It contains a user layer and abstraction layer. I will go to this point later. The second is fully self-consistent, meaning that you can use 9ML to fully and unambiguously to describe your model, to define your model. The third is it's highly extensible. Well, there are dozens or even hundreds of uh, single neural models, synapse models. It is impossible to propose a language to cover all of them. And new model got in created every day. So we design our NIML to be very highly extensible, meaning you can easily to add support for new feature, new models into the language without changing, uh, changing the specification. So now let's, let me show you a couple examples of the problems of uh, modeling share, model sharing and reproducibility. And then I will demonstrate that how NIML is designed to solve this problem. First example, this is a paper by Sean Hill and Tononi. This is a model that, uh, uh, a model for sleep and wakefulness. And in this paper, they um, specify network connection in a table and uh, uh, parameters for neurons to synapse in a freeform text. <laughs> Second example, this is a paper by me and Xiao Jing Wang. And this is a model for uh, perceptual decision. And we specify our, uh, there's a network connection in an ugly form, and uh, again, also uh, the neuron uh, parameters in freeform text. I, I have to take this opportunity to say sorry for everyone who ever read my papers and try to implement it. I know how difficult it is. And for any neural network models, there are dozens, at least dozens of parameters because there's no standard way to describe them. So it's very easy to forget to mention one or two or several parameters when you write a paper. If you have experience in 
implementing other people's models to in your simulator, you will know how difficult it is, and you always end up have have to email to the authors to ask for those missing parameters. Oops. Okay. Even you can solve the first layer of the problem that having a good description, standard description for models you will immediately encounter the second layer of the problem, which is reproducibility. This shows an example regarding the timing in the simulators. So there are two, typically two type of uh, strategy regarding timing in simulators. The first is um, clock-driven, and another is uh, event-driven simulation. In clock-driven simulation, the simulator keep a fixed size of t uh, simulation time steps. At the end of each time step, the simulator counts how many input, new, input spikes to this neuron and then update the uh, memory potential accordingly at once. In, in event-driven simulation, that the simulator keep exact timing of each spikes and update the uh, memory potential whenever there's a spike. And in this example, you can find that for event-driven simulation, the neuron already fired at second spikes and that creates a small difference between clock driven simulation and event driven simulation. Usually the time steps is small so the difference is tiny. However, they can produce a big difference in the result of simulation in some cases. For example here if you consider a spike timing dependent plasticity. In clock driven simulation that all three spikes, input spikes precede uh, post-synaptic spikes, so they uh, produce a big uh, synaptic facilitation. In event-driven cases, that only two input spikes precede uh, your post-synaptic spike, and one happens after it. So that will cause a much smaller synaptic change. If you let network run for 1,000 seconds and look at the distribution of synaptic weights, this is how it looks. At, for event-driven simulation, this showing in a black curve. And for other, for clock driven simulation with different time steps are all showing uh, other curves. You can see that the distribution width are significantly different. The true science in a computational model lies in the concept that it delivers, not in the way how we implement it. It's a technical detail. Unfortunately, many uh, computational neuroscientists spend too much time fighting with those implementation details. So how 9ML is designed to solve the problems? In 9ML, we separate a model into two layers. User layer handles parameterization and instantiation that uh, uh, specified parameters and single objects in, in the model. And we have an abstraction layer that specify that it explicitly to define the models, like equations, functions, and graphs. And user will, typically the user only need to handle user layer. And the abstraction layer tell the simulator how to implement the simulation. And let's take a deeper look. In user layer, we specify the values of those uh, neuron parameters and number of neurons, number of uh, populations and layout and so on. And in abstraction layer, we specify, we give exact the uh, complete equations and the rules for the changing states inside the uh, neurons or inside your model. And also connectivity, uh, uh, the, how you create uh, connections and so on. And we use Markov languages for both layers. Now let's look at some examples for uh, user layer and uh, abstraction layer. Uh, we have a poster today presenting more detail of uh, user layer. I encourage everyone to go. For a neuron, a single a leaky integrated fire neuron, in 9ML it's a node. It's a top, a top element, top layer element. And the uh, node has uh, sub, several sub-elements, definition, properties, and the uh, optional node. And this shows to you a complete uh, code for uh, user layer for the uh, leaking integrated fire neuron. 
as you can see here, well, this is node. This name is a user given name. You can give any name that later when you need to refer to this neuron, you just use this name. And then the definition elements here, uh, the definition can be a URL point to somewhere else. And here this points to 9ML abstracting layer specification. And this is how we connect uh, two layers. And here, the simulator, by reading this, by looking at the URL here, simulator will know that this is a 9ML standard 1.0. It's a neuron, and it's integrate and fire neuron. And then by looking into this file, the simulator can get equations and rules and exact impl implementation. And then in the property element, you can specify the values for every parameters like initial voltages, spike threshold, and so on. And then last, you can have a free from text uh, uh, write anything that you want to tell other user. And the note element, this top level note, is a basic building block in the user layer. Many things can be a note in user layer. For example, Parson Spectrum Generator can be a node, and it points to, again, to an IML um, specification, uh, uh, abstraction layer specification. And for Parson Spectrum Generator, you just need to specify the fire rate. And also, you have injecting current as a node, and the post synaptic response as a node. It may look a bit strange to you. Intuitively, you might say that, well, I, I think it's better to call this, instead of a node, call it a uh, Parson generator. And here, well, I would like to call it uh, injecting current elements, and here, uh, synaptic elements. The problem is, if you do it this way, and then when you need to create a new object and new models, then you have to revise uh, user layer specification to add into creating the new top level uh, element names. And by calling everything as a node, when you want to add a new stuff like a new uh, input device, you still call it a node, and you everything, anything you just need to do is to supply, supply uh, abstraction layer definition, and then you are good to go. So that makes the language highly extensible. Other than node, there are several other top level uh, elements. A group, that's when you want to create a neuron population. And look at here. When you declare a population, you just need to specify uh, the prototype of the neurons you want to use. This is what we uh, declared previously. And here you just use it. And then you declare the layout and the number of neurons you want. And that's how you create a population. Sometimes you need to uh, make measurements from or make synaptic projection to a subset of neurons inside a population or across populations. That's when you need to use a set. In a set, you can use the select to choose uh, neurons that meet certain criteria. And another top level element of projections. In projection, you specify the source of the neurons and the target of neurons. And then the response, synaptic response, plasticity, and rules. Here you refer to the, the nodes you just created. And now you put them together, make a connection. OK. Now, let's go to uh, abstraction layer. We also have a poster today, uh, tomorrow, to present more detail of uh, abstraction layer. Here is an example for uh, abstraction layer definition for leaking integrated fire neurons. For uh, leaking integrated fire neurons, for their, uh, they, uh, this model has a very well-defined substructural dynamics and a well-defined spike, uh, spike events or spike triggering mechanism. And in abstraction layer, we define, this is how we define the ODE, this one. And then here you can see we have independent variable V and dependent variable I, T. And now we give this ODE a name called substantial equations using the binding comment. And then for the uh, spike events, 
that we check whether V is larger than or, or equal to theta, and then we assign this to a spike event, and we give this a name, threshold equations. And a complete substratial regime for integrated fire neurons is a sequential operation. First calculate the equation and then check for spikes. And this is how we do it. You use a se sequence command to combine these two together. That tells simulator first calculate uh, the equation and then check for spikes. So this is a small example how we how can you define a substructural region for integrated fire neuron. And this is another example that uh, how can we uh, create a random random network. Now here we want to what we want to do here is we want we have two population one population of uh, excitatory neuron another population of inhibitory neurons we want to make random connection within and between them. In IML abstraction layer we first combine these two population together and give it a G3 and then G3 as a, a whole uh, whole population and then we create a random graph with a number of a vertex, this number n is the total number of neurons, and the probability, connection probability. And then in the third step, we, uh, we, uh, here we give it a uh, name G4. And in the third step, we combine these two together, G3 and G4 together, that creates a random network. Okay, we are still working on the specification, but we plan to have our first release by the end of the year. By the time, we hope, hopefully we will have a draft specification and a user tutorial and support library with many type of uh, neuro, uh, models for neuron synapse and so on. And also proper, we plan to have a Pine to implement uh, 9 mil. And if you know 9 mil, know that once 9 mil implemented, then several other simulators can use it automatically. And we also will give uh, several uh, example description for some models. Summary. We have uh, model sharing and reproducibility in computational neuroscience. And we designed 9ML to solve this problem. It has several uh, unique features. And if you use 9ML, it will allow you to describe, to define your model in an unambiguous way and simulator independent way. And finally, this work is supported by multi-scaling modeling program in INCF. This program has an oversight committee that set a goal and general direction for the program and give a mandate to the I should have the last slides. Yes. To the tax force which performed the actual work. And thank you everyone. Thank you for your attention. Uh, may I express a sincere admiration with your clear layout of all the problems which are here and just because it's in, in the beginning stage, but it's still very impressive. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, a very, very technical question. So you, uh, you, you clearly presented the need to have a node that is uh, generic and independent of any particular nodes. May I know why you don't do the same thing with properties? You are why you don't have properties type equal conductance. Then you could externalize the description of the properties in an external ontology that will provide you unit consistency and relationship between different properties. Uh, sorry, I don't get. Uh, can you, uh, if you if you show the, the, the slides where you show the nodes, so the uh, nodes? you explained us why you have a generic okay. uh, node element. Right. This one. This. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we, we can see it with the property here. So okay. you explain you right. have a node name equal. Um, you should probably actually have so this a, a human is... readable name and something else. But, oh. but you have a generic node, right? So right. you can expand. But for the properties, 
Okay. You don't do the same thing. You, you create one specific element, conductance, decay time constant, reversal potential, which means each time you want a new property, you, you're forced to create a new element. Uh, we use a free form uh, XML. That means we don't really give a strict um, definition for, for each node what kind of uh, property you need to have. So ideally that uh, uh, you can create you need property, but inside the property, what type of uh, 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 sub element you need to have? Of course, that depends on what kind of a model or, or object you're, you're declaring, but uh, I think that's fine. You can okay. use a new tag, and the similar, as long as he, uh, as long as he knows uh, if you want to answer. Yeah, I might just, just add one point, and this particular version of the user layer is actually very likely to change in the next meeting. Um, and I think it's it's important. I mean, we will be taking into account your, your suggestion. Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, um, this is a, just a, a very early draft of uh, the language specification. And in each of meeting, we always fight with each other. So the specification change back and forth. Um, the don't take this as a, like a final uh, product of uh, of the team. This is just a, a present our idea. Hi. Uh, if I were trying to use this, I would be afraid that I did it wrong. Um, and in a lot of software testing, there's an idea of a test harness where you can give it known inputs and get known outputs. And I'm wondering if you guys have thought about ways to sort of encapsulate sample data and expected results. Yeah, we actually, of course, we're going to do that. And we have a several benchmark paper that uh, uh, we are actually we are trying to and have implement them and, and then use the language to, to describe those models and then use a simulator to run to see whether we can get uh, expected results. And, that's, that's, and I think when we release our first version, we will show those examples. Just a detailed question on, on this, what we're looking at right now, the, the markup language. Will it allow you to enter a variance term for every one of the, for example, for the conductance, for the, uh, the values that you set? So you can say, my resting membrane potential is 70 millivolts of mean, but my variance or error around that is X. Yes, we do have uh, the, the elements for variance. You can specify your variance. So in, in the further development of, of the, this, <coughs> of, of 9ML, will you be able to change from integrating fire neurons to having more complex compartmental neurons instead? Is that sort of an ultimate goal? Yes, uh, that's in, yes. we're thinking to, to doing that, but of course not now. Right now we only focus on the simple neuron. But our goal in the future is to implement more details model, even multi-compartment or other Hutchinson-Huxley type of uh, neurons. Yes. Any other questions? If not, thank you, Chen. Thanks.